Harvest Chapel International presents the Overcomers Convention 2019. Theme: Seven for Significant Impact. Ministering at OC 2019 are Reverend Dr. Isaac Quay, Bread of Life Christian Center, Bishop Gideon Titi Ofe, Pleasant Place Church, Reverend Dr. Michael Bodin Yamiche, the Maker's House Chapel International, and Prophet Prince from Pong, Kingdom Praise Ministries USA. It's from Wednesday, 27 November to Sunday, 1st December 2019, 6 p.m. from Wednesday to Saturday at 9 a.m. on Sunday at the Tehila Temple Harvest Chapel International, South Tesano. Morning sessions on Friday 29th and Saturday 30th November with Dr. David Eldon Schroeder from the Pillar College USA. Spread the word and don't come alone. Your host is Reverend Fitzgerald Odonko. Music by Harvest Gospel Choir and others. Oh, It's a good way of running demons out of town. Hey, hey, hey. Hallelujah. Happy birthday, my brother. I don't know how old you are today. But well, at least I know you are one year older than your last birthday. So that's okay. Amen. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this Overcomers conference 2019 thank you so much uh, for the invitation and uh, you are not my friend you are my brother you are my brother hallelujah by this time they know it at word of life i have two ways of introducing people i say well this man is my great friend in the lord they know the level of relationship. But when I say that this one is my brother in the Lord, it means that we will rise together, we will sing together, we will fight our battles together, we will celebrate our victories together. Amen. And you are not my friend, you are my brother. And I want to thank God for your life and all the great work that you are doing for the kingdom of God and for his name. And it is my prayer that the kind of God's grace and mercy that has preserved you all these years will continue to sustain you. That when we are 80 years old, we will all organize a wonderful party, invite some of these young guys to come around and enjoy the goodness of the Lord. Thank you again for the invitation. I honor you and celebrate you. You are a good man. God bless you. Amen. And to your precious wife, thank you so much for marrying such a wonderful, wonderful gentleman. I am very careful what I say about this precious man of God and the wife. Because my wife comes from the same community where it comes from, Savla Badi, and I don't want to be stoned when I go there. Amen. All the great men of God in this church, I salute you. Reverend Titilati, it's always a joy to have you, a wonderful man of God. The rest of you, I might not know you by name, but I honor you. I thank God for your life and thank you for standing by my brother to champion this great vision of reaching the nations of the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. As for Harvest Choir idea, today, I put it on record. I will not write you invitation letter again for Live Conference. When you see the advert, come. Yeah. Amen. Because you have family. Amen. Oh, great plan. You can't believe it. I brought in my foster parent from the U.S. to come and visit Live Conference. And we had the wonderful search, and I said, how did it go? He said, that night, the only thing that really touched my heart is the song from the invited choir. And I said, which one? He said, have a choir. And I said, praise the Lord. This is not fair. <laughs> so you did a great job. Thank you so much, Reverend Daxon, and thank you so much uh, for, for being a blessing to us, Professor Spencer. Duncan, may you live long. 
and God bless you richly for the great work you are doing for the kingdom. I have never been confused in my few years of ministry preparing a sermon for a convention than this one. Extremely confused because I was battling with two sermons on my mind and I prepared enough for each and every one of them. I sat behind my Bible for a very long time last night, went to bed, meditating and hoping and praying that God would give me one out of the two to share. So I prepared my notes, wrote the scripture, the theme, everything for both of them. My protocol theme, Reverend Kavu is a wonderful man of God and, and, and minister. That I met him and I said that Reverend is true. For the first time, I am confused. Which one should I preach? And he confused me the more because the points he raised confused me. I call my wife and I say, I have these two sermons, one here for your brother from South Labadi, and this is another one. Which one should I preach? She looked at my face and said, can't you put the two together? <laughs> Amen. Some of those confusions are necessary because out of the midst of the confusion, great revelations do drop. <laughs> Amen. Out of the midst of the confusion, great revelations do drop. I've said it here and let me say it again. Read your Bible. Nature divine acts of God, they always begin in the night. Study your Bible. Major divine acts of God, they always begin in the night. You said, is that true? Read your Bible. Creation did not start in the day. And the evening and the morning was the first day. God did not give the covenant to Abraham in the day. He said, come out of your tent, look up, you see the stars. You don't see stars in the day, you see stars at night. God took the children of Israel across the Red Sea, not in the day, but at night. And east wind blew the whole night, and they went through the Red Sea. If that is not enough, Jesus Christ was not born in the day. While shepherds were watching their flock by night, he was born. Yeah. Eh? Eh. Major divine acts of God, they always begin in the night. And if that is not convincing enough, the last time I checked, Bible says that Jesus Christ will come like a thief in the night. So major divine acts of God, they always begin in the night. So when you see somebody go through what you might call a night experience in his life, don't be in a hurry to conclude on the life of that individual because for all you know, a major divine act of God is about to take place. I have learned by experience that when people go through stuff, it is a sign that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Bless your word, my father. With abundance of revelation today, I pray in the name of Jesus. Influence my mind with the intelligence of the Holy Spirit. Let every word that will proceed out of my mouth bring praise and glory to your holy name. Now use this vessel of clay to bring honor to your name. And Father, I thank you for what you have done. I thank you for what you are doing and for what you will do I say thank you. Receive all the praise. For thine alone is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Amen. Amen. Great men of God have 
have shared the word of God with you for the past one week. And I thank God for their lives and the great revelations they have poured deep into your hearts. I believe you have received deep prophetic utterances with divine accuracy from the throne of mercy from anointed men of God who have gone ahead of me. And I sometimes you wonder whether you are really needed because after all this prophetic declaration and deep revelations from God's word, you ask yourself, what else am I going to say? I feel like just saying, amen, go and sit down and say, just continue to soak on the great things you have received. I'm told uh, Reverend uh, Titi Ofer was here. He was a blessing. Bishop Titi Ofer was a blessing. Dr. Nyamiche Boedi was here. A great blessing. Uh, Prophet Prince uh, Frempon was here. A blessing. Professor Ch was here. A blessing. Who again is left? And your papa himself has been here to pour out blessings upon your life. So I don't know whether to start from the Old Testament or to start from the New Testament because they've handled all the subjects. Oh God, have mercy on this Accra boy in the name of Jesus. Because everything has been prayed. But this morning for the next few minutes, may I please engage your attention on this very simple subject. This is a year of significant impact. So serving God with significance, if, 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 if I could say that, how do you serve God in the midst of the storm? How do you serve God in the midst of the storm? Friends, when everything is okay and your prayers are being answered, and miracles knock at your door every morning and all your dreams are being fulfilled and all your heart desires are being realized it is very easy to serve the Lord because the right environment has been created for you to serve God and anybody can serve God under that kind of condition Everything is okay. Everything is all right. When you wake up in the morning, the first thing you hear is people praising you for the great miracle you perform somewhere at a TV. You wake up and you feel like serving God and pouring your heart to serve him. It is easy to serve God when you walk into church Sunday morning. And your members put up to you and they keep on giving you living testimonies of great things that happened to them when you preached the previous week. You begin to hear testimonies of great manifestations of the power of God. Friend, we can all serve God because you are motivated and encouraged to press on to serve God. But when you wake up in the morning and the last thing you want to hear is the radio. And the last thing you want to read is a newspaper. And you have an assignment to serve God and press on the assignment God has entrusted into your hands. Whether you are an usher, you sing in the choir, you are a preacher, you are an elder in the church. When everything is against you, and you keep on hearing that voice of the Lord, who can rise up and go today, it becomes a very challenging experience. The question is that how do you serve God? In the midst of the storm. The word storm, somebody defined it as a disturbance of the atmosphere. The atmosphere is disturbed. 
and it produces a colossal amount of a, a serious demonstration of destruction. Sometimes houses are destroyed, places get flooded, lives are even destroyed in the time that storm takes place. In military terms, when we talk about storm, they say that it is a sudden invasion of a secured place. They will suddenly invade a secured place. A comfortable environment is suddenly invaded with the intent of causing destruction. In military terms, they say this place has been stormed by the military. During the days of Jesus, there were a few manifestations of storm. Matthew spoke about it. Mark wrote about it. Luke wrote about it. And John gave some few commentaries here and there about it. But for the sake of our teaching, let me pick on Mark's writing on the stormy situation that took place in the life and in the ministry of Jesus. I am picking on Mark because the professor is here will tell you that the first gospel written is not Matthew. Mark is the first gospel written. So you will see Matthew and Luke picking bits and pieces from some of the research writings of Mark to advance some of the things that they said. So Mark wrote it. And Mark, in writing the gospel, his intent was to reveal Jesus, manifest Jesus to the people as a son of God. Matthew was more concerned about presenting Jesus as a Messiah, as a Messiah. But Mark said that, let me show him to you as a son of God. And in Mark chapter 4, verse number 35, reading through to the end, that is verse number 41. And maybe we'll look at some few scriptures in Mark chapter 5, starting from a few of those verses there. Uh, I'm not going to take a lot of your time, but I want us to look at this particular writings from this great writer, Mark. He wrote about a stunning situation that Jesus and his disciples went through. One fine day, they were all sitting down there. And the same day, when the evening was come, he said unto them, Let us pass over to the other side. That sounds like an instruction from a master to his followers. The evening has come. The evening has come. And he told them in the evening, Let us pass over to the other side. So they did the sailing, not in the morning. The instruction was given in the evening, let us pass over. I told you, major divine acts of God, they begin in the night. Let us pass over to the other side. The disciples responded to the instructions of their master. They jumped into that little boat, sailing on the sea of Galilee. And may I please submit to you, the Sea of Galilee is not an ocean. It's a lake. It's not an ocean, it's a lake. The same thing is called the Sea of Tiberias. It's the same thing. Depending upon where, who is looking at it and where the location is. The river Jordan flows into the Sea of Galilee and it flows out of it. A small pool of water, they call it the Sea of Galilee. Jesus said in the evening, let us cross over to the other side. And on the other side is the land of the Gadarenians, the city there called the city of the Gadarenians. Jesus said, let us cross over. The disciples obeyed the instruction of their master. May I please pause here to say that when you see people go through storm, may, may I emphasize that? When you see people go through storm, don't conclude that they've done something wrong. Sometimes your obedience to God can lead you into the storm. Your obedience to God 
can lead you into the storm. It was Jesus who told him in the evening, let us cross over to the other side. And the Bible said that whilst they were sailing, a mighty storm came up against them. Matthew said that it was so severe they were in jeopardy. Luke recorded the same thing. A mighty storm came up against them. And we see storms on the lake of Galilee or on the sea of Galilee because when the strong winds blow from the mountain down over the lake and it meets the hot air that springs up from the surface of the lake in the evening, it creates a lot of stormy situation over the lake. So there was storm. And the funny thing is that whilst they were going through the storm, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, was resting on the pillow asleep. I'm not, I'm not a fisherman, but, 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 but I come from the coast. And, and I've hung around the coast long enough for me to know that there is no way any sensible human being can sleep in the midst of a storm in the boat. If you have even taken sleeping tablets, the rocking of the boat will wake you up. He was not only sleeping, the man was sleeping on the pillow at the back side of the boat on the Sea of Galilee when the storm was so severe that an experienced fisherman like Peter could not handle it. And the man has played around the Sea of Galilee all his life. He could not handle it. Jesus was sleeping on the pillow in the midst of the storm. I believe it was Matthew who said that it was so bad that water was entering into the boat. So if he was so deep asleep that the rocking of the boat could not wake him up, at least the water should touch his leg and say, man, wake up. The waters were getting in sleeping. The boat was rocking, sleeping at the back on the pillow, sleeping. It was so bad that all the disciples started screaming for their life. And Peter, self-appointed leader of the group, got up and went to Jesus and said, Master, Master, for the second time. One that is that don't you care that we perish? King James will say, Master, Master, we perish. Stone. We came on this journey. Not by our own volition. We came on this journey because you instructed us to do it. And you are sleeping. At the back side of the boat. And the water is about to swallow us up. Master, don't you care that we perish? The Bible said, when Jesus woke up, and people have presented this thing over the years, go through a written man, he break manuscript. I have a professor here, he, he's in theology or leadership. And he, will, he will analyze it for you. When you go into a written Hebrew text, the translation was a little bit distorted into the English. So the English, they give us the, the, the impression that Jesus Christ woke up, he looked at the storm, and he said, Peace be still to the sea. And the sea come down. But when you read the original text, it gives you a different indication. Because number one, you don't say shalom to things. You say shalom to people. And that is peace. So when Jesus woke up, he turned to the disciples and said, shalom. Peace to you. He turned to the storm and said, be still. He addressed the disciples first. He said, shalom, peace. 
to you. Then he turned to the storm and said, be still. The Bible said, immediately, the storm ceased. And then he turned to the disciples again and said, but where is your faith? But where is your faith? In the midst of the storm, address people before you address things. You will understand that later. When you run into storms, as a leader, take care of people before you take care of things. Jesus said, Shalom, peace to you. And to the storm, he said, Be still. Immediately, they cross over to the other side. Three very important lessons I wanted to pick when you run into the storm. Three drama. Three things happen. When the storm becomes so severe and the storm is opposing you, you have a choice. Either to go back to where you started from. And it's very easy to do that because the storm is blowing against you so the storm will aid you to go back to where you started from. Or you can decide to jump out of the boat and sink to the bottom of the water or you have to make up your mind that come hell, come high water, I'm going to sail over to the end. It's a decision you have to make. You are either going back, jumping into the water, or fight against the opposing wind till you get to the other side. They cried on Jesus. Three people. Eleven of them have given up. One of them took leadership and went to the right source. Master, we perish. And there was a third man in the boat. He was sleeping in the midst of the storm. Sleeping in the midst of the storm. Reverend Quake, where are you getting to? I will get there very soon. You got what I want to say. Moving on. They got to the other side of the lake, the region of the Gadarenes. And Bible says that when they got to the bank of the lake, the first human being that greeted them was not the chief of the area or the religious leader of the area a demoniac met them a man filled and possessed with demons he was the first human being that met them cross over to the other side Jesus did not talk about the storm he said, we are crossing over to the other side. There must be an assignment out there for which Jesus said, we are crossing over to the other side. We've seen some ministry sources in this side of the lake because Jesus' ministry was around the lake and around the Sea of Galilee. We, we've seen a lot of miracles, healings, deliverance, breakthroughs. There's a need for us to cross over to the other side. You have experienced tremendous miracles. Harvest trouble. Maybe for the past years. Beautiful edifice. Touching nations of the world. All over the place. Blessing people. In villages. I went to a village. I want to buy a land there. I was going to buy plenty. 250 acres. A village. Now you know what I'm talking about. Then I went there and the man told me, you hurry up and come and buy. I said, what? He said, because a certain church. And I said, tell me, in a crowd by the name of Harvey, they bought him ready. Can I get part of you? I can give you 250. It tells you how far you are going. They said they bought me. I said, How did they do? He said, As for them, that's the part I didn't like. 
I was trying to negotiate and pay small, small. Don't mark my English on that. And uh, negotiate and pay small, small. Few, few, kakran, kakran. Eh? Few, few. Then the man said, Reverend, hurry up. And I saw what we see. Half a step when they came and they went to land commission. And they just gave me one chest straight. I said, hey, Reverend, don't go. What about fleeing a few of you? Oh, my check, boom, I can't tell my hand. Well but I'm saying that to say that villages you are touching them, cities you are touching them, nations you are touching them, lives have been transformed. We all know about harvest, uh, uh, the, the program you organize every Easter Saturday, is that right? We all come there to be blessed. We know the work you are doing in our communities, our villages, our towns, our cities. Apart from preaching the gospel, you are touching the lives of people with a lot of your social programs. Helping the poor. Helping the poor, feeding the poor. Medical program, computer education. You are doing it. And you have done very well. <coughs> On this side of the lake. But there's a need for you to cross over to the other side of the lake. You have experienced success. You are comfortable. You are happy. You are praising God. You are excited on this side of the lake. And I came there to clap my hands for you. And I said, God bless you, man of God, a great visioneer. Great work. On this side of the lake, <laughs> on that side of the lake, when they mention the name harvest, people begin to give testimonies. I was healed, I was blessed, I was delivered. God prospered me in great work on this side of the lake. Jesus said, It has been great on this lake of the lake, on this side of the lake. Now there's a need for us to cross over to the other side. After this conviction, there's a need for us to cross over to the other side. And any time God designs an assignment for you, that will not be personal in nature, but territorial in nature, the storm will blow. Any time God changes the situation, in the realms of the spirit and begins to give you an indication that you are moving to a higher level in the assignment you are entrusted into your hands the first thing that will greet you will be the storm because the devil doesn't like it he doesn't want you to go over to the other side Go over to the other side. The storm will come. And when the storm comes, please don't throw in the towel. The one who gave you the instruction is still capable of calming the storms and giving you what you need to cross over to the other side. That is why Jesus was sleeping. In other words, he was trying to tell the disciples, I told you, let us cross over. I did not say, let us sink in the middle of the lake. I told you, let us cross over. And if you believe me as your master and your savior and the one who instructed you to cross over to the other side, all you have to do is to sleep in the midst of the storm because you know that he who gave that instruction is able to to sustain you sleep cross it over crossing over read your bible when the church started acts of the apostles they were so comfortable arguing over theology in jerusalem and jesus said i know what you do he brought in a little shake and they scattered all over preaching the gospel God is saying, you have been comfortable in this area. We are crossing over to the other side. And when they got 
to that sign. But then firstly, I was expecting Osovo that, 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 that they know the Messiah is coming. Some beautiful eight years old girl should hold some flowers. Plus the, plus the director of the community should host the king should have come to meet the savior and said, sir, you are welcome to our territory. We've heard about the great things you've done on the other side. The sick have been healed. The dead raised, blind eyes opened, great manifestation. And if you are coming to our religion, our region, we thank you, sir. You are welcome to our territories. The miracle you did there, please do some in this area too. That is the natural protocol. But the first thing that met them was a man possessed with demons. An outcast from the community. His demonic manifestations were so strong that the family could not contain him and the community could not handle him. They tried to chain him. But when they chain him, he breaks the chains asunder. Bible said he would take a stone to cut himself. And whilst he's bleeding and screaming, he keeps on cutting himself. My God. We still have people like that too. Somebody is sniffing cocaine. He knows the thing will kill him. He doesn't like it. He's crying. But he's still doing it because a force beyond his control is behind that action. They met him. You read your text very carefully. Read your text very carefully. Uh, read your text very carefully. The Bible gives an indication that man was a sorry gate. That man was carrying all the demonic representation in that territory within him. So he said, I am a legion. He was carrying it. All the demonic attacks carrying it on behalf of that community. They did not realize it. That the man was going through that for them. And they cast him out. And let him out there. Representing their pain. Their hurt. Their frustration. Jesus said, we've conquered this area. There's a need for us to take new territories. We had to cross over to take new territories. And in crossing over, the storm will come. It will not kill you. It will come. I say it will not kill you. It will come. The storm will shake you to the point that instead of you depending on your expertise, you will see the need for the Savior. Can I say that again? The storm will shake you to the point where you will know it is no more about theology. But it is about grace and deeper relationship with the master. Peter forgot about all his fishing skills. Ran to Jesus and said, Rabbi, master, teacher, don't we care that we perish? Oh yes, Tom has a way of doing that. To shake you! To the point that when you wake up in the morning, you have no other choice than to run to the master and say, Jesus, this one, my skills have failed me. My knowledge has failed me. My doctor says he cannot do anything about it. Ah, the drugs they gave me from the pharmacy. It's not working. My lawyer says that this one is a difficult case. You run to the master and you scream, Master! Don't you care that we perish? I pray that the master will stand up for you. <laughs> Hallelujah. He will stand up. Receive some help. And to the son of eternity, say, shut up. Be still. Because they were moving to the other side. They were greeted. Demon possessed man. When the young man saw Jesus.
Bible says he started screaming. Look at the Matthew chapter 5. You see the started screaming. Thou son, called Abrahamish, the Messiah, art thou come to destroy me before the time? What the community could not do, what the whole town could not do. Excuse me. Ah, boy. Help this a crowd, boy. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. What the community could not do, they've done everything they could do and fail. So they've left him to himself. Self destruction. When he saw Jesus, he said, Master, Lord, Son of the living God, I thou come to destroy me before the time. I thou come. And Jesus said, What is your name? So we are legion. Yeah, no doubt a legion. Because within that young man was all the troubles of the community. The sicknesses were there. The depression was there. Every failure. A story gate man carrying every pain on behalf of the community. That demon made a simple negotiation with the master. He said, I am prepared to leave this body. But please don't let me leave the territory. We have, we, we have conquered lives. We need to conquer territories. We have conquered lives. We need to conquer nations. We have conquered communities. We need to bring cities under the covering grace of Jesus. But after the storm, the entities that control the city will meet you. They said, Master, I know you have the power to destroy. You have the power to destroy. I want to leave this body. But as for the community, I don't want to leave it. I, I, I don't want to leave it. So Jesus said, deal. Leave this man. The head of swines here. Enter into them. Do you know something? Yeah. Professor Duncan, I got to realize the Gadarenians, there must be a strong presence of Gentiles in that community. Number one, because under no circumstance will a Jew enter into piggery. So for that to be pigs, raising pigs, in the area gives an idea that it might be a strong gentile community. They are there. Wherever they can go, they are there. Enjoying the fertile lands around the Sea of Galilee. They can do the agricultural business. They feed their swine. Gentiles. They have done a great work with the Jewish people. Jesus said, let us cross over. There are other people here. They don't have any covenant with God. There are other people here. They don't know how to call on the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There are other people here. They are forsaken, rejected, kicked upon. There is a need for us to cross over cross over. Jesus said let the swine let the demons go into the swine and then the swine rushed into the lake they all got drowned in the lake this is just by the side, side issue. Those who say that you are so religious you don't eat pork uh, uh, I'm not, I'm not adverse this is not a pork shoot you are so religious you don't eat pork I agree with you. Good, don't eat it. Me too. I don't. You are so religious. Don't eat pork. 
But the question is that when the demons entered into the swine, where did they go? Into the lake. Is that right? And they died. Who ate the carcass of the pig, the fishes? So if there's something we call demonic transfer, then the demons left the man, entered into the pig, and from the pig to the fishes. <laughs> so if it is an issue, not, not an, a, a health issue or a medical issue, but a religious issue, they rather eat the pork and stop eating the fish. Yeah, because that, that, that is where they started. And I bet, I bet, I bet, this one is not in the Bible. I bet that two weeks later, guess who? Peter went a fishing on the lake. Hey! Don't get too religious now. Cast them. They all got drowned. But the men in the community, they all rushed. And guess what they did? When they came, he said, this man, Jesus, he should leave us. We don't want him here. He'll be killing our pigs. He'll be killing our swines. He'll destroy our business. Thank you, Reverend Jackson. Thank you. He'll destroy our business. All the domain do business is going down. Jesus, leave our community. And then the young man from whom the demons came said that, Jesus, I want to follow you. Jesus said, no, you are not following me. You will stay here. You have been, you, you, you have been a surrogate. You, you have been a reservoir. Contain all the demons within the community. Your deliverance it's not only an individual deliverance, but it's a deliverance that's affected the whole community. And now that you have been set free, go back to that community and tell them about what the Messiah has done for you. Go tell them! Jesus said, <coughs> individuals have been healed, but now I'm setting a whole community free there's a need for you to cross over to the other side. You have stayed in the arena of comfort for so long a time. I don't know about you. We also do, we do conferences. Sometimes at the end of the conference, with all the money you spend, ask yourself a critical question. What impact has this conference produced in the life of individuals, number one. And how many people have those individuals influenced with the grace and the anointing they receive during the conference? It's a critical question we all need to have. Other than that, we'll be like Jesus and the disciples on the other side. There's a need for us to cross over with all the prophetic declarations to challenge new communities, to challenge new communities, to challenge new families, to challenge new people with the grace that we carry. Other than that, it will be an annual religious ritual. If after this conference, I'm not imparted to the point that I can bring a chain to my family and a chain to my community. I'm not done well. For God and for his kingdom and for all those who impacted my life, Jesus said you have stayed in the zone of comfort for so long a time. There is a need for you to cross over. There's a need for you to cross over. After this conference, I come here with an apostolic challenge. Rise up, cross over, make a move, touch somebody, lay hands on somebody, set somebody free. You have stayed here for too long. Cross over. If your service 
will carry in the sense of significance, then it must be defined in the lives and the destinies that are transformed through your service. The anointing is of no consequence if it cannot break yokes in the lives of people. It cannot heal sickness in the lives of people. It cannot bring transformation to the lives of people. That anointing is of no consequence. I'm getting a little concerned about prophesying over one another's head. Be prophetic over one another's head without that prophecy being translated into an agent of change that to turn communities and cities around. He was a loner. Everybody in the community has rejected him. Ah, for the sake of my wife, for the next five minutes, let me show you something. I'm talking about serving God with significance. In the same way, Jesus Christ, excuse me, <coughs> forgive this boy. Jesus Christ, he went to preach the gospel. He have crossed over to a new realm where it is no more individuals getting blessed, but a whole community following them. Luke says 4,000. I believe Mark said 5,000. They were confused about the figures. They said men. And Bible says some of them ran. Matthew said that they ran. Mark said that they ran when they heard that Jesus has come to town. Oh, I said to myself, this is good news. You can decide to go and build your church at Usuwim or Usudoku. Chief, when the grace of God is upon the church, and you are taming destinies around, and you are casting out demons, and you are serving God in a way that your service will bring in part, people will come from Kashua, they will go through all the traffic, and they will still come there. When the grace is there, they will run to where the grace is. When the anointing is there, they will run to where the anointing is. People are looking for solution. And when you carry it, it doesn't matter how far you live, they will come. There's a woman who passed on not too long ago, Antique Grace at a place they call, uh, uh, you know, Antique Grace, where is she? A Dunfa. People travel all the way to go and sleep there. They leave their air-conditioned homes to go and lie down there because they felt like there's a solution or a miracle in this area until you come to a place, including mine, as a church, where your location will not mean anything to the community. There's a need for you to go on your knees again. They ran looking for Jesus. And Jesus preached all her day. Oh, I love Jesus. He can preach. See, the difference between the preaching of Jesus and the preaching of Paul is that Jesus will preach all day. People will still receive the word. They get hungry. In the case of Paul, Paul preached all night. And there was a young man sitting by the window. One leg in the church and the other leg on the other side. Sitting. And he was sleeping while the preaching was going on. And Bible said that in the midst of the preaching, he fell asleep and he fell over. Guess what? He did not fall into the church. He fell outside the church. Think about it. He was hearing the message, sitting by the window, sleeping. He did not fall into the church. He fell outside the church. So when the congregation members rushed to the place, Bible said the first statement they made is that there is no life in him. Then Paul followed up, looked at him and said, I can feel some life in him. Bible said Paul prayed over the man, life came into him, he got resurrected or restored or whatever it is, dragged him back to the church and continued preaching. Can I say this in passing? That as we come to church every Sunday, 
we will still have some people who will be sitting on the spiritual windows of the church, one leg in the chair, one leg outside the chair. When they fall over to the other side of the chair, don't kill them. If you can lean over them, you will realize that there is at least a little life in them. There's some life in them. The congregation said there's no life. Paul said there's life. He wasn't listening to where. He fell over. He crashed outside the chair. A basleting sister. A basleting brother. He drank a little whiskey. He did something stupid there. He did that he has fallen over. But there is still life in him. Stop killing yourself. You need them. He brought him over. That's Jesus. But in the case of Peter, he preached, uh, fed them spiritually. Uh, till the disciples, these two known people again, I'm closing. They went to Jesus. And he said, Master, we know you. That's my own addition. Thank you. We know you and your long sermons. You have preached the whole day. They have listened to you. Now they are hungry. What do we do? You know some girls are like that. Eh, we suffer from that. We can't wear that. We need be bad. We talk to them. We need be a dear. Now they are hungry. And Jesus said, "Go and buy some food for them." And they start debating. <laughs> Jesus, your mass is wrong. Tell it. We serve five hundred men. How much money do we need to do this? How much money do we need to do this? And Jesus said, what do you have? Five loaves, two fishes. I want to leave this with you. As you serve God, and you want to leave some significance in serving, four ways of serving God. Number one, you have to serve God with a lot of compassion. The Bible said, and Jesus had compassion on them. Serve God with compassion. Serve God with total dependence on the grace of God. When Jesus took the bread, he lifted his head and he prayed. Five loaves, two fishes. He did it with compassion. He did it depending upon God. Number three, Jesus served God in an organized fashion. He says, sit down in hundreds, in fifties. Let, let them sit down in hundreds and in fifties. Don't be sporadic in the way you serve God. Be strategic in the way you serve him. He says, sit down in organized fashion. Luke said that fifty. Mark said that hundreds and fifty. Sit down. And Bible said that they went around and they fed all of them. But the one I want to live with you today is that Jesus said, having fed them, Gather the fragments. Gather the broken pieces. In every church, in every community, we have the fragments. The broken pieces. They are broken with their habits. They are broken with sin. Like that Gadarania demonia. They are broken with different attacks of the enemy. Broken pieces. Jesus said you've been fed but gather the broken pieces. There are broken pieces everywhere. In your home, you have broken pieces. I will never forget that story of a man in closing, preaching a powerful convention like I'm doing today. And right from the back, a man walked into the church smelling, stinking, alcoholic, so drunk, he was walking his way, half drunk, to the front. And the ushers heard him and said, that you cannot go in front. Then the pastor saw him and said, allow that man to come. Singing some hymns in his drunkenness. Singing hymns. And the pastor said, do you want to give your life to Jesus? He said, I give my life to Jesus today if that is what you want. 
he was drunk, gave his life to Jesus, went. He stayed in the convention for all the 14 days that the man preached. The last day of the convention, he prayed for him. They did not see him again. Prof, they did not see that man again. 15 years later, this preacher has become the superintendent of this big organization. He went to Latin America to go and open schools built by the community. The director of that project stepped forward. The preacher looked at him closely. He also looked at the preacher closely. And the preacher said, you look like somebody I know. He said, preacher, you also look like somebody I know. Then the story started. He said, I'm this bishop. I said, oh, I know you. Can you recollect? Some 15 years ago, a drunkard walked through the house of the church. The usher said, no. Don't come. We have protocol here. Don't come. But you asked me to come. You prayed for me. You remember? The preacher said, yes, I do. And you prayed for me again. The preacher said, I do. So when I left the church, that convention, I decided alcohol will no more be my friend. If you have showed me enough love and care, I want to commit my life to the God that you said. Everybody rejected me, including the protocol. But you accepted me in my brokenness. I made up my mind. I want to serve God. I went to Bible school for two years and I started serving God. I did my master's still serving God. I studied this still serving God. I've been working with this organization. They said, who will volunteer to go to Latin America to go and do this? And I said, I will because I was broken and somebody gathered my fragmented pieces. So I also want to go and gather other broken lives. When I got to this community, I realized people were broken because they did not have education. They were broken because there was no health care. I started the project. The organization recognized it. I built this, I built that, I built this. And they told me that the general superintendent is coming to dedicate the building. I did not know that I will meet you. I want to thank you, sir, that in my brokenness, you guarded me. Jesus said, you have eaten, but gather the broken pieces. If your service will be significant, don't ignore the broken pieces. We have them all around us. 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 Reverend Dustin, your voice might be that magnet that God may use to gather that broken pieces. Reverend Fritzrat, my brother, let us do it and do it again. They might not know how this praise might be the platform where those broken pieces will be gathered with concentrated so much on the loaves that we have forgotten about the broken pieces. If your service had to be significant, please don't let us forget about the broken pieces. Jesus said, you, you, I have fed you. I have blessed you. I have helped you. But please don't leave the broken pieces out. Because sometimes the broken pieces, they are broken in suit. They are broken behind their wheels. They are broken in the airport residential. And they might be broken in Trasaku. Broken! Broken. Smelling good, but broken. But broken. We must gather the broken pieces. Gather them. And if we can focus on the broken pieces, our service will be significant. If you can focus 
on the broken pieces, our services will be significant. Do you understand that? Over 40 years ago, so for in closing, a young man, I said I want to serve God. <coughs> Everybody thought I was crazy. Not today. I was crazy. Family said, we said our money. Everybody said nothing good can come out of your life. I was wearing one big old Patakari. I jumped on the race from Car Price Hotel where we used to live and prayed in tongues all the way to John Tay. I do it on daily basis on the railway lines. Praying in tongues. With a group of friends we call ourselves Francia. Praying in tongues. I got to the place one day on my way back at Achimota Forest. Today, it is the forest did not start. It started closer to the railway line there. We were in the bush there. Praying. I had a gallon of water. Praying. I was afraid to get back home because I couldn't stand the position again. And I said to God, Lord, we have to settle the matter here today. You either answer me or I die in this bush. And God is my witness. I threw myself on the ground, prayed in tongues for close to 10 hours nonstop. I only lifted my head because I realized that I was bleeding from my nose, screaming in tongues with my gallon of water. I was a preacher. I was a broken piece in the inside. A young girl by the name of Nanaya, she was then a student at uh, that's where I ran so upon. In fact, the man guys, we've gone to organize some wild student outreach. Everybody has left me. He was looking for brother Isaac. He saw me at Atmata Forest, dirty in my clothing, screaming like a madman. He saw for this little girl walked to me, about 16 years old, shook my hands, and said, Brother Isaac, if nobody believes in you, I believe in you. Keep on pressing on and serving your God. I could not hold my tears. Those few statements from a 16 years old girl put my broken pieces together. Although I was a preacher, I am standing here preaching today because somebody decided that he would not ignore the fragments that I left behind. She picked my fragments put it together injected hope into my life i used the water to wash my face and my head and i said nana if you believe in me i will do it for god i'm standing here today because a 16 years old girl did not leave my fragments shattered around but he put my fragments together I challenge you at the end of this conference, as you leave this place, look out for some fragments. They are broken. They are broken in your offices. They are broken in your family. They are broken where you go. They are broken. Some of them are your bosses. They are broken. Some of them are your subordinates. They are broken. If God will open your eyes, they are broken fragments scattered over. If our service will be significant, that we don't let us ignore the fragments. Jesus said, you have eaten. You are happy. You are satisfied. But don't ignore the fragments. May that be your challenge at the end of this conference. Because they are scattered all over the place. Do something about your fragments. Do something about them. Do something about them. They are broken. Do something about them. Jesus crossed over because there was one broken man carrying all the demons of the community. As you leave this place, may it be your personal challenge. Pick some fragments. Pick them. They are broken. Pick them. Pick them together. And may God grant us the grace that we will see those broken pieces around here.
Amazing love. How can it be? But thou, my God, should die for me. Amazing love. Amazing love, how can it be? Oh, yes, yes, but my God is sure. Two simple prayers today. Two simple ones. My first prayer for you today is not that God should give you a million dollars or ten million dollars or every million dollars. No! Those who have gone ahead of me have prophesied into those things. My humble prayer today is that God should open your eyes that wherever you go after this conference you will see the broken pieces. You will see them. That's my first prayer for you. That God should open your eyes. That wherever you go, you will see the broken pieces. They are scattered all around us. Broken pieces. My second prayer, Reverend Axe, I've been saying, what's up, Bishop? I've been saying that when they have heard the gospel, but they want a gospel with compassion, a gospel with a touch, not just quoting Hebrews and Greek over their heads. They want to feel like you feel the way they feel. Compassionate evangelism. I know you do it in this church. You do it in this church. But to someone with your permission, I want to do something today. Some compassionate. Do you know the number of people who go to bed? Prof in this country without food. You think the whole of Ghana is Accra without food. If you have to touch set a person with the gospel, it will go beyond speaking Greek. There must be some touch of love. I play a bit of golf and it's good. I have cut this. They, they carry the ball. And one day I decided to engage them, asking them questions. Why? I used to go to church. I brought some of them. They were playing trumpet and saying that church. One of them looked at me and said, Can I make a confession? I said, Go ahead. He said, You are different. And I said, Why? He said, Because I carry a lot of people here. One man the other day, because I lost one ball. Look at my face and said, I am useless. He said, The whole night I could not sleep because I am not catching balls for those people who I didn't want to do anything with my life. 
He said, I love both parents. Seven years old. I have two other siblings to take care of them. He said, Bishop, I have finished SHS. These are my grades. But in order for me to help my younger siblings, I can't get to catch balls for people. So at least by the close of the day, I'll have some 40 CDs in my hands and say, you buy food, you buy this one. Take some to pay my rent here. He said, the man look at my face because I lost one ball and called me useless. But you come here. You give me money. You buy food for me. Sometimes you hug me and say, well done. You did a great job. I want to come to your church. But Bishop, I don't have nice clothes to wear. As I'm such a big man, I can't give you one. But take this money. Go and buy yourself some t-shirts. Get some trousers and came. Sunday, I finished preaching. I was going walking to my car. And somebody tapped me on my shoulder. I turned around and said, I told you I will come to church. I am here. Pray for me. I cry. Broken pieces. Today, some of you did not ask me to do this. But today is your birthday. Let today mark the birthday of something we will do to tie the broken pieces. I need people to help me do that. So let us raise a seed 